Welcome to Victoria Rumble Room, an island show that likes to punch above its weight on island issues, BC issues, Canadian, whatever. We try to grapple on with things. And, uh, you know, I say we fight above our weight class. And considering the weight of these two hosts, that's no small feat in itself. Over that's in his right. Spanish lair is <laughs> my my co-host with the most, the Croatian sensation himself, who's still getting a lot of fan mail from Croatia, newly returned from a holiday there. And uh, Johnny, it's great to uh, get rolling on this show. And as we do get into this program, I want you to always remember you should never, never give up. Robin? I won't, especially now that I know there's a never give up day proclaimed by Victoria City Council. In fact, among some of the more important proclamations made by council have been wrongful conviction day. And I'm a man of my convictions, Robin. But now Marianne Alto, Mayor Marianne Alto, will take over responsibility for proclamations, leaving council time to debate Less important matters. Less important. Gee, I mean, what could be more important than something like Parachute National Injury Day? Yes. I've always I had agree. that marked on my calendar. Yeah, and uh, you know what, that. Johnny, what they really need, of course, is they need a Victoria Rumble Room Day. Yes. Wouldn't that be great? Yes. And uh, I, I think if, if the mayor gets out and proclaims this, we would show up especially if they had fireworks, it would be pretty exciting. And um, I, I guess now, of course, we have to now shift to less important matters. Well, actually, that's not true. If you consider the weather, because it's very important. The weather has been so incredibly dry. Hasn't been that hot, but this is the driest time I can ever remember. No kidding. I'm actually starting to hold, rethink completely my garden. There's no rain. It's like a desert. We're now the driest city in Canada this summer. Amongst many other accolades, we have that one as well. We've only had 30 millimeters of rain in the last 80 days. We're only at 57% of our normal rainfall since July 8th of last year, Rob. It's just crazy. And you know, we're at level five now. Level five, which is the highest level in the province for dry. And, uh, you know, thank goodness. Victoria has a very large reservoir, or I think we'd be in a crisis situation right now. And uh, a couple of weeks ago, we, of course, spoke to a climate expert, our pal, Dr. Andrew Weaver, and uh, he talked about the fact that uh, this is part of climate change. This is global warming. This is the new normal. In fact, he says, uh, we don't actually even know what the new normal really is. Did a quick look at seasonal forecast for the rest of um, June, July, August. It's looking like it's hot and dry. And those are the conditions that are precursors for fire season. Um, and when we, we must also remember that when we talk about it's going to be above normal or slightly above normal, we continually redefine what normal is in the climate community every 10 years. So now normal is no longer defined over the period 1951 to 1980 which is what we called normal when I started out the field of climate. We'd, we'd figure out the normal climate or variability or weather patterns in the period 1951 to 1980. And then it was 1961 to 1990. And then it was 1971 to 2000. And then it was 1981 to 2010. And now normal is defined as the average weather conditions over 1991 to 2020. So our whole definition of normal has chucked up too by half a degree or, or so globally. So, so you no, know, really, there's nothing normal uh, about what we're seeing. It is, and, but it's also not the new norm. And a lot of people um, don't realize that it gets, it, it, it doesn't get stay like this. It gets worse and worse and worse as time goes on. The climate remains pretty hot in the Ukraine as well. As in continued conflict hot, as Ukraine attempts to take back territory from Russia, in this bloody, tragic conflict. Lots of developments every week, per hour, every day. For example, a Ukrainian drone attack has smashed the 12 mile long bridge that connects Russia with Crimea. It will take weeks to allow vehicle traffic back on that road. A big connector between Russia and, and, uh, and Crimea destroyed. Drones and long range attacks seem to be making a bigger splash than the troops on the ground. 
Mind you, there are troops on the ground building in parts of Ukraine. It's looking like there could be another Russian offensive or a counter to the Ukrainian counteroffensive in uh, in the north, heading towards Kharkiv. We'll see if that happens, and uh, that's worrisome. And uh, you know, as for the Ukrainian counteroffensive, it seems to be moving slower than first predicted. So what's really happening? We turn again to our military expert, regular panelist, and guest on this show. Chris Kilford, and uh, let's zoom him in. And now back with us once again in the Rumble Room is retired Lieutenant Colonel Chris Kilford, who is uh, also the president of the Canadian branch of the Canadian International Council. Welcome back, Chris. I'm glad to be here as always. Thanks for having me. Well, great that you're available because there's so much to talk about. So much is happening in this conflict between Ukraine and Russia. Of course, Canada is very directly involved in many ways in the support we're lending. Only a few weeks ago, it looked like there might be a coup. And then suddenly there wasn't. Now we have the ongoing Ukrainian offensive. It hasn't resolved anything, but people keep saying there could be a breakthrough. And, and, and on top of all that, the Russians threaten fairly frequently that they're going to do something diabolical, perhaps with nuclear energy, whether it's a nuclear bomb or blowing up the nuclear energy plant in Ukraine, shades of Chernobyl. So after all of that, do you think that there could be some sort of a new escalation that we're maybe not fully anticipating, like breaking that dam? Could, could a nuclear situation still happen? Well, you forgot to add in cluster munitions as well. The American oh. supp uh, supply of cluster munitions to to Ukraine, which has upset a lot of countries, including Canada. So it's a it's a very fluid situation right now. It has been since the beginning, but it it just seems like so many things are happening all at once at this particular point in time, especially with NATO meeting in in Vilnius uh, right now, and uh, what we saw happen in Russia with Prigozhin. And uh, you know his whereabouts, and then he then he's meeting with Putin after afterwards this supposed coup attempt. It all speaks to such a mess going on right now, especially on on the Russian side. It, it must be incredibly fragile in in the Kremlin, let's say. So, are, are any big surprise though? Do you think around the corner? You say things are happening rapidly, but we do hear a lot of very angry rhetoric, and you keep wondering whether there could be some sort of an escalation out of out of yeah. left field like I, I i keep talking about nuclear and it, it's a big fear it's a big worry it is yeah so you know what we do know of course is on the front lines on that thousand kilometer front line that there's a lot of fighting going on and ukraine is making small gains but obviously people would like to see it happen more quickly but as Zelensky said this is not a movie uh, this is a real war so this 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 is something that we know is going on and we do see we'll see cluster munitions being provided by the United States, F-16 fighter jets, the pilots being trained on those too. So that's a little, another escalation. On on the Russian side, when you, when you are looking at all of this, you're probably feeling that your backs are up against the wall. Your back is up against the wall. It has been for some time, but now you're really feeling the pressure because of course you've had this attempted coup and you've even had now the Turks thumbing your nose at you as well. You know, you've been working reasonably well with with Turkey up until this point, but they but they recently released five commanders of the Azov Battalion into the hands of Zelensky when they told the Russians that that would not happen until the w war was over. So, so you've got that, and of course Tur Turkey suddenly saying yes, okay, we'll let uh, we'll, we'll, we'll uh, Sweden please, yes, now you can join. So this is another blow to to Russia as well. So on the Russian side, you you. You've been running out of options. You've got far fewer. And so on the nuclear side, yeah, of course, it's always there in the background. Um, but I think, you know, there's always one step too far. You you take in these wars, as we've seen, escalatory steps. Uh, everybody always saying, well, that's a little bit too far. That's a little bit too far. But the fact is, if you do opt for nuclear weapons, you've crossed more than a red line and so there would be a massive price to pay for russia if they did that so so i, I think i think it's unlikely uh I, I don't believe it would happen i would think putin would be removed from power before the nuclear uh switch was was pressed chris always so fascinating to get your take on this crisis and 
in Europe, as Robin had mentioned, and as we've heard all over the news, it recently looked like the Wagner Group was within 20, 30 miles of marching straight into Moscow. Then suddenly they stopped. Uh, so let's dig a little deeper uh, uh, sort of into a, one of the many, many silos from this war. And that part is the, the, the Vladimir Putin side. He looks weak. Uh, does all of this uh, activity make him more desperate and dangerous? I keep seeing him on TV bravadoing all over the place. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, I think it does. It does. Of course, it threatens his position to have a part of your armed forces. I know the Wagner group is technically a little bit separated from from the, the Russian military, but let's face it, they're an integral part of the Russian military um, to have a portion of your armed forces attempt to approach the capital, shoot down your own people, helicopter pilots and, and a reconnaissance airplane. I mean, imagine just imagine the the animosity that would exist now in the Air Force in particular, uh, the military writ large as well, towards the Wagner Group for that for that series of incidents that took place, you know, killing your own people. Mm -hmm. So so we saw him approach Moscow. Uh, we then saw everything um, de-escalate, and then we weren't sure where he was. Was he going to Belarus? Uh, suddenly he appears in Moscow. And what I think one can read from that is that in places like Africa and in Syria, the Wagner Group arguably is is Russia's foreign policy. And if the Wagner Group is not being paid and functioning, everything that Russia's been doing in Africa and Syria starts to fall apart. And so in the Kremlin, they realized, I think, that as much as they they, they can't stand the man, Prigozhin, they, they had to come to terms, like two mafia bosses, I suppose, coming to terms, realizing that uh, they were going to begin to, to lose not just what was happening in Ukraine itself, uh, and the fragility within Russia, but there are a whole foreign policy around the world, uh, even in places in South America, Central America, where the Wagner Group operates. You know, it was all fall apart. So these were desperate times, calling for desperate solutions. And as they always say, you keep your friends close and your enemies closer. And I think this is a classic case of that. Let's talk a little bit about the way social media is being used as a tool by both sides. But to, let's talk a bit about the Ukrainians. It seems to me that the Ukrainians are getting a tremendous amount of support from NATO, from the United States, from Canada. Well, Canada and the United States are part of NATO, but they're getting even more from the United States than they probably are from the rest of NATO combined. And it seems that there's a lot of tanks there now. There's a lot of other weapons. You mentioned there's going to be cluster ammunition, which is controversial. And yet you go online and you see, well, we're just talking to the fellows on the front lines. If they don't have more missiles soon, we're, we're going to run out of missiles. Or we're talking to the guys on the front lines. Well, we can't push faster because we don't have jet fighters. They have fighters and we can't counter that. We need to get those F F-16s as soon as possible. Why didn't we have them sooner? And and you start wondering, well, what's true and what's not? I mean, are the Ukrainians really stymied because of these big, long defensive lines and the Russians and the mines and everything? Or is it more going according to plan? And it would be a wish list, a nice wish list to have these other things, but it's really not stopping them from doing what they planned on doing all along this year. So war is always all-consuming. And People start these wars with their various logistics tables that would say, for example, well, you're going to be fighting over two weeks. You'll need 10,000 rounds of this and 5,000 rounds of that. And you quickly throw that out the door because you soon realize that the war is terrible and you burn through ammunition at rates you never imagined. And so you do get those calls from the front lines. And when soldiers call from the front lines, as they did in our case in Afghanistan, our soldiers calling from the front lines saying, we need tanks, we need more UAVs, we need this, we need that. And the Canadian military, the government responded. So in this case, the Ukrainians, you know, they're the ones facing the Russians and realizing war is tough. You need the best tools you can get. And they also know the West is somewhat can be distracted at times. So you have to keep the pressure up on, on, on the West to provide these weapons and you need them. If you're on the front lines, you want everything you 
possibly get so that you can you can win this war. So I get it from the Ukrainian side. And when I look at the Ukrainian side itself and and they they you know they they're desperate obviously to join NATO and and there's discussions going on about that right now. There probably won't be a set timeline but but uh, you know there'll be some sort of commitment. But I do look at the situation right now and I and I and I think to myself you know, for all intents and purposes, this is a country that is part of NATO. I mean, it's not written down. There's no agreements per se. But but the the free world, if you like, NATO and many of our other allies are pouring in billions and billions of dollars of equipment and 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 money and aid and everything you can imagine. Uh, it, it's like an Article Five, short of putting boots on the ground or attacking Russia and other parts of the world. Um, for all intents and purposes, this is a country that that if, if it was part of NATO and was attacked by Russia, we 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 are engaged in 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 a, in a war ourselves, but nobody wants to obviously say that. Um, um, but but we are. I mean, all of these weapons going into Ukraine, which are being used by Ukrainians, are designed to do one thing, and that's to kill as many Russians as possible. And uh, win the war at the end of the day. And it's taken on a much larger sense than just Ukraine and Russia. I, I want to get into the Russian mindset on this a little bit. And I was just thinking as you were talking about the uh, the fact that uh, the Russians are not well equipped and perhaps not very well led. It reminds me of the First World War, because I believe Russia had the largest standing army in Europe. Even though uh, when the war started, they were just annihilated by the uh, Austro-Hungarians and the and the Germans, and uh, it, it got so bad, and so many men died, and the, the conditions were so terrible. But that was the beginning of the Russian Revolution. That's what it led to. So there, there, there seems to me some analogy there. And and I wanted to ask you. I'm I'm pulling back to the social media thing again from the Russian side because we see this. They keep showing groups of men stepping forward and saying we're with such and such a regiment or such and such a group and we're asking uh, we're asking uh, Putin to please help us we're not getting arms we're not getting supplies we're getting bombed by our own guys we're getting uh, no support from our officers they run away and it's not once this has happened it seems like this is a regular occurrence how far are these things seen? Do people across Russia see these broadcasts? And what kind of effect does this have both on the military morale, but also morale across the country, if indeed they are seen? Yeah, it's it's really hard sometimes to peer b beneath, you know, to open the curtains on Russia and see what's happening out there. We know the that- The Iron Curtain. The Iron Curtain, the, the, the older population we know gets a lot of their news from television. Uh, we know uh, essentially one in four younger Russians using VPN networks can access information. Um, but, you know, at the end of the day, you see all of these things. You feel helpless if you're a Russian as to what you can actually do. If you're just a regular citizen, what can you do? I mean, there have been um, lots of chat that's picked up on this. They know how desperate many, many of them know how desperate things are on the front lines. That's why you saw so many leave when the first wave of conscription was was begun. Um, you know, they're not, as I said before, they're not stupid people, uh, but it's also very hard to admit that you're wrong, that you went into Ukraine to denazify it, but that was just, you know, false information and you've been led down the garden path and you, you are as a nation, you know, you're beginning to realize that people are seeing you as as murderers, as killers, as baby killers. You know, you it, it just gets it gets gets worse and worse, and no one likes to see themselves this way. So then you get this sense of denial, I believe, uh, that that takes place. Um, it's a, then a question of where do you, you know you feel like you can't do anything until it breaks. And you made that analogy of the First World War and the collapse of the Russian military at that time. Well, of course, there was a big civil war that followed, right, for several years until the Bolsheviks could, um, you know, actually cement their control. So Russians themselves, you know, they live in a very dark place, I believe. They they live in a very, very dark place through the the Tsars and post-World War II with, uh, with uh, Stalin and, and so forth. Um, it, it's a world that they have un, been unable to escape from, uh, even even in in 2023. So the psychosis, the people, how they see the world. I mean, this is this is very this is a very damaged country. Okay, uh, Chris, let's bring this back to North America. Bring it back mm -hmm. to Canada, and look at this now from another angle. Obviously, I think Canadians very much support Ukraine. 
and their efforts. You can see their flag waving everywhere. I also note a major survey coming out of the U.S. shows that over 70% of the American public support supplying the Ukrainians with more equipment and supplies. This precludes a majority of Republicans. Uh, so if this support holds, um, does this encourage Ukraine to hang on longer? Or conversely, do you see that breaking? Are there any cracks in the public support uh, for for this war? I don't, I don't see it. Um, I don't see it here. I don't see it in the United States or, or elsewhere, although it is expensive. And I think in the global South, uh, they would be looking on a gas, thinking about all the billions that are being spent on weapons that could go to other things. And that's very true. Um, where you might see issues, of course, is is in the in the resiliency of of Ukraine. Um, that's not to take anything away from the Ukrainian military, the people themselves, but um, to to keep having the number of casualties that they are. And others speak about this. Their population is only of a set size, you know, forty million, and Russia is much larger. You do worry about the attritional sense of this war and how long Ukrainians can can keep going. I think. From the Ukrainian side, when they see the support coming in from the West and other allies in the terms of weapons and money and so forth, it's a massive morale boost for them that they're not feeling abandoned. I think that's the worst thing that could happen is if they felt that they were abandoned on the front lines and then the morale would plummet and and who knows how things might go. On the Russian side, of course, it's the opposite. I mean, they don't get proper food, proper clothing, proper weaponry. They're watching behind the scenes and seeing, seeing what's happened. And they're not stupid people. And and you you do think to yourself, you know, while this war is a bit stagnant right now with only incremental gains on the Ukrainian side for the most part, you do wonder though when something might break on the other side. We've had one example recently, obviously with Prigozhin. Um, when will there be another fissure created? Chris, I'm yanking you all over the world here. We've been in the Balkans. We've now took, I took, brought you back to North America. I'm bringing you now to Turkey. Uh, and I'd like to dive a little bit deeper into that. Of course, you have deep experience with Turkish affairs and their country. And uh, most recently, uh, Erdogan acquiesced and allowed his vote for Sweden to join NATO Open the curtains for us, please. What is going on? Was he paid off? Uh, how did this change after a year of opposition? <laughs> yes, it's a very interesting situation. And so if you have any Turkish viewers, of course, I'm going to say the what we, we should be saying, Turkey um, now the official name of, of Turkey. But I always default to Turkey because I haven't made that switch in my head yet. But but what's happening there? It, it, it's, it's fascinating to see. But I mean, look, uh, President Erdogan... Uh, Won another five-year term in May, so he's feeling good. He's he's feeling confident, um, but he also knows his uh, economy. It's the economy is very weak. He has uh, someone new at the at the helm of the central bank. Uh, interest rates have have risen. He's trying to uh, rein in inflation and and prevent the further slide of the Turkish lira against the American and the Canadian dollar and other currencies and so on. So he knows he's got lots of issues going on there as well. He can see what's going on in Russia. He probably senses, like many countries in the region do, that Russia's time is up. And so if you've got any beefs with them or any issues, you you now have the upper hand. And so we then see this surprising twist of events, let's say, with the with the release of, of the five uh, Azov battalion commanders that, that um, Turkey was, uh, you, know, you know, had had in their country on, on the provisio with the Russians that they wouldn't give them back to Ukraine until the war was over. And, and, and we suddenly saw Turkey you know, releasing them into Zelensky's hands. That was a huge snub to Moscow. They're not happy about that at all. Right. Um, Turkey says, look, this grain deal that we have in the Black Sea area, you know, if, if Russia won't agree to it, we'll provide our own ships to escort the grain ships, the Ukrainian grain ships. There's another snub to Russia as well. And then this sudden turn on, on the Swedish issue. Again, another snub to Russia. So suddenly... Um, Erdogan, uh, who's often have to play a, a, a sort of junior role to 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 Putin, although he wouldn't would never never admit to that. That's for sure. Um, suddenly, I think he feels like he has the upper hand, and and he's now looking to the West to say, 
hey, I'm doing all of this great stuff. Um, I would like to see you help me out, certainly from an economic perspective. One day it's here, one day it's there. Uh, help us understand where they're sitting. Are they? Is is it beginning to look, or has it looked already like the Turkey position, where there's a bit of pro-Russia? Okay, now they're losing. Tell us more about that, please. I think everybody has been talking about democracies and and the the the, the liberal world uh, being under threat, and and the backsliding of democracy in many countries. But I think what Putin has done. For the world is is actually woken up many of the democracies to say they say, say to themselves you know what we actually have is worth preserving and and worth investing in your armed forces your security services and, and protecting yourself from cyber attacks you know and just protecting your people as well look you know what we have is is not perfect you know democracies are never perfect but what we have is about as close to it as you'll ever get and so um we've seen this this incredible wake up call and it's thanks to guys in moscow that we've had this and i think around the world there's also awakening up in brazil and other places that you know you, you, these leaders these these leaders that we've seen in the last few years the trumps of the world let's say you can't get away with that anymore or you shouldn't be allowed to get away with it and we're going to stand up for what's right so i think fundamentally Putin has unleashed a, a wave of change on 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 the on the planet Earth that he he never never ever imagined. You know, Chris Kilford, I love this guest. I just love him. Spoke to us about a week earlier and talked about Canada's increased presence in Latvia. Something I wasn't aware of. Soon, two thousand soldiers will be joined by their families as they provide NATO security in the Baltic. Since we ran this update. We've had some viewer mail, always engaging. Bill writes to us, I thought it was a troop rotation kind of thing. Not sure about individuals staying for all three years and families moving there. And, you know, in response to that, uh, Chris Kilford also mentioned that he felt that this was going to be a deployment similar to what we saw in Lahr, West Germany, which was the major Canadian base in West Germany, uh, for a long time prior to the Berlin Wall coming down. So once again, a need for more of a Canadian presence in Europe, and it looks like it's going to be in Latvia for the foreseeable future. And uh, we did have another note on this topic from Jerry, and he writes us, It's interesting, growing up in a Navy family, my father was involved in many wars, conflicts, and NATO service. It's automatic for Canada to be involved. Canada and NATO not being involved would be like being almost pregnant. You either are or you aren't. And Canada is always there. And so it's always great to hear from our viewers. We really appreciate this feedback. And uh, on that happy note, John, it's almost time to wrap the show. Can't believe it. Can't believe it. It's so much fun. A great show. Great content. We really appreciate our over one and a quarter million people that have now viewed our show collectively, accumulatively across many platforms. What are those platforms? Well, Facebook is our sort of mothership. Uh, we have a Twitter account and we have a YouTube account. All of our uh, interviews are inventoried there and you can view them quickly. We participate in many Facebook news groups as we do with Instagram and with TikTok, always an adventure. For now, Robin, I'm John Juristic, and I declare because I just love doing this for some of our viewers, that this is electric bike day. Because what the heck, I love my bike. And you look great on it, Johnny. And, and I would like to once again declare this unofficially because they haven't actually proclaimed it yet, but unofficially Victoria Rumble Day. And uh, you know when they do get around to proclaiming it, boy, we'll have a big party. But for now, Holy. I'm Robin Adair and Rumble On. Rumble On.